All right, Pro Aging Posse, I got a good one for you today. Not only do I have a good friend, but I have a colleague, the very well-renowned Dr. Andrew Giacono. Now he is a, I mean, most of you probably know him from Instagram and just being around the bend for a long time. He's written an enormous amount of textbooks. He's taught all over the world and his before and afters are transformative. Now you've heard of Batman and Robin. You have heard of <laughs> Hall and Oates. Um, you know, you've heard of peanut butter and jelly and, and Pe peas and carrots, this guy. peas and carrots. Yeah. I don't know who's Hall and who's Oats, but I really look at this guy's work as complementary partnership to the type of stuff that not only we all do in terms of pro aging and wellness, but also types of stuff I do in cosmetic dermatology. So Dr. Giacono, thank you so much for showing up today. I know you just got out of the OR, right? No, I took Friday off today, brother. <laughs> you came to came to speak to me on that day off. Look at that. Um, you know, one of the first and the reason why one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show so quickly is because we both know we're in the middle of a huge cosmetic boom. You would agree, right? Yeah, the biggest probably boom in history, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about this, all of our peers, I think is the, the reason for this. Is it just post COVID? Is it just people want to, is it retail therapy for people? Give me, your, give me your perspective on what's going on in the, in the cosmetic world right now. Well, I think it's like, it's a perfect storm of many factors. Um, one is for sure, we're hyper aware of our appearance. Uh, you know, I got to say that I've been looking at my ugly mug during FaceTime consultations because you know, you're, we do everything virtually now, and I don't think we've had so much visual feedback of our appearance in the history of the world. Because, of course, we've taken pictures of ourselves and post them places, but we haven't spent hours and hours of a day on video conferences and chats in all, across all disciplines and all industries. So we know every flaw. We know it real time. We knew it on video. It's not even a picture anymore. It's real time video and probably some of the most unflattering lighting that exists, right? You're in your Maybe you're in your dining room or living room taking a, a conference call and you're in finance or, you know, you're somebody who's a medical professional. It doesn't really matter. So we all know our flaws more than anybody ever did. We have the time to recover. And that's always been an issue, right? I mean, your patients, yeah. they probably scheduled Especially coming. Especially your patients, yeah. right? Yeah, but yours too, right? If they're coming in for injectables and they want to get, you know, a number of things done, sure. they're going to come in on yeah. Friday and on Monday. I mean, that was the old world. Yeah. Now it's like you can skate. You can recover from things. So recovering... It's better than ever. And then the other thing I think is for people who have the resources to engage cosmetic treatments, they're not spending their money on other things. You know, they're whole, everybody's holed That's up true. at home. And there was a big New York Times article That's about true. this. People are collecting things like art and cars at rates that have never been seen before because they're using the disposable income, not on travel and other things. And one of the things that they're investing their disposable income in is their appearance. So I think it's a perfect storm. They're doing more than one thing at once. I know when I refer out patients, you see a lot, of, we share a lot of patients. Um, you know, they're not going to be like, oh, I'm going to do the neck now. I'll do the eyes later. I'll do a brow another time for the same reason that people want to do fillers, Botox, lays. They want to do everything at once. Don't you agree? Yeah, they do. And I think it's smart as well because they realize that this is the best time in the world to get it together. And I do think that if things are at a fever pitch like this moment, because people realize that with vaccinations and with the spring and the summer coming, everybody wants to be ready. And I think it's going to be, I, I hope it's safe, but I know that everybody's yeah. been bursting at the seams. It's been a year, you know, we've all been away from family, friends, and, and spending time with people in the way we like to. And I think that with vaccination and with this, this thing starting to tail down, I think we're going to be doing a lot more social things and enjoying ourselves. And we want to look great. You know, everybody do you, knows. Do you, do, you, do you think this boom, because again, I speak to dermatologists as well as plastic surgeons. Do you think it's a sustainable boom? Do you think it's just going to continue off like that? Do you think like in a year, no one's going to have time for us anymore? I mean, this, this is the thing I'm curious about. Is it going to just be, is the growth like the stock market just going to keep going? You know what I mean? I think that there will be, uh, I definitely think that there'll be a sustained effect, but not at the level that it's at. I do think, not the level. yeah, because even with, you know, a return to some normalcy. I think that most businesses are planning on a hybrid model of work. So, you know, being, you know, client facing in a, in a, in a real way, video, in a real video way, 
is going to continue to drive people, you know, to be able to, to want to maintain their appearance. Because, you know, yeah. hiding behind a computer or working in office and not being client facing, being video conference facing, you know, all over the world, it's the norm. You know, I think it's kind of like when email started. You know, before email started, all of a sudden email came around and everybody communicated through email, right? Now it's like the pandemic ripped off the band aid because people would do occasional video conferencing. Now people are going to demand video conferencing. So I think yeah, that yeah. that pressure is going to continue. But I don't think it's going to be at the fever pitch it's at now yeah. because, you know, things will go back to some cadence of normalcy and back to work and everything else. And people won't have the same time, at least in my world. I think in the dermatology world, and in the non-invasive and minimally invasive world, those things will continue. But I think the boom for things like facelifts will definitely decrease because you still need weeks to recover from a facelift. You don't need weeks yeah. to recover from your touch-ups. And I think that those touch-ups that you do the most are going to be the ones that are going to be especially valuable as maintenance as people continue on in this new video world. Well, you know, once people get used to looking good from non-invasive, we, as we know, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, it all always becomes a law of decreasing returns, which inevitably leads to the more invasive things. So it's getting people in the maintenance of it that they know and will feel more comfortable with the, the more aggressive techniques that are absolutely necessary. Um, you know, people seem to think that, oh, if you do non-invasive things from an early age, you'll never need a facelift. And people also think if you never need a, if you get a facelift, you'll never need the, 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 the non-invasive in the middle. Of the, and we know that that's not true. Oh, it's total let's go to the deep plane. Yeah, let's go to the deep plane facelift, because I know this is your area of expertise. Dr. Giacono is really one of the academic and clinical trailblazers. Uh, he teaches this all over the world and has really ma made the deep plane facelift like part of like the cosmetic vernacular. I want you to give the audience just a very brief review. What makes it different than like the facelift of 20 years ago? Give me a brief well, history. So, well, the first thing is, is that it's not the facelift of 20 years ago, the other facelift. It's the facelift that has continued to be performed by 98 to 99% of plastic surgeons, and that's a SMAS facelift. And it's not that it's bad, it's just not as effective and it doesn't give uh, results that are as comprehensive and as rejuvenating. And it's a very simple thing, and I'll try to break it down very quickly. So a SMAS facelift is what's called a bilamellar technique, which means, very simply, the skin is peel peeled back from the face, so they're peeling the skin like an onion. Then what they do is they do something to the underlying muscle along the jawline. It's called the SMAS. So if people have jowls, they want to tighten their jawline, but it really can only rejuvenate this part of the face. And that's what usually creates sort of a characteristic tight look along the jawline and a little bit of a distraction of the corners of the mouth, which is a telltale sign of a facelift. And even though we say it's 20 years ago, it's still the most commonly performed procedure wow. by 98% of surgeons. And I was trained to do it too, you know, and I did it until yeah. probably about 2007 when I started doing deep plane surgery because my patients looked as, you know, un unfavorable, let's say, as everybody else's and my patients weren't the happiest and I wasn't ha the happiest with the outcomes. What deep plane surgery does is it doesn't separate the skin from the muscle layers at all. So it keeps the, the entire thickness of the face intact and it lifts the entire face from here all the way to here, which is a big problem area. And I know you yeah. put you know, fillers yeah. in here to lift the cheeks and yeah. you, you do other things, put threads in here. But what it does is it gets under all the deep structure, the falling fat, the falling muscle. So it doesn't treat a part of the face and it doesn't lift it this way and it doesn't peel the face like an onion. It goes under the deep structure and it moves it up vertically against gravity. And when you do that, the face goes from being heart, you know, square back to heart shape. Because what happens with age is we go like this and we fall, the lower third of the face becomes wider, the mid face drops, the cheeks go away. Getting under all this deep stuff and moving it back up recreates a heart shape of youth which is looks more young, youthful but also it looks natural when my patients ask me and i always say deep vein li facelift is the most natural most modern i say it's like moving the mattress instead of just the sheet it, right? it, it is it's like moving it's you know my, my nurse harriet you know who's my been with me for over 20 years um she's like my my ride or die you know when she talks to patients about when they ask this question She's like, well, you know, when somebody pulls the, the covers real, real tight on the surface, that's a smash facelift.
But you know when you lift up under the, all the, all the all the the structure of the sheets and the duvet, and you like lay it down very nicely, and it lays smoothly, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's not like you can bounce a quarter off of it. That's a deep plane surgery. Yeah. It's soft, it's smooth, you know, it, and it looks like it should. <laughs> it's natural. So I know one of the common things that patients come into me for um, post years post facelift, and it's certainly the most common after the SMAS, is they develop um, lipoatrophy laterally. Yeah, yeah they, they do. They really need enormous amount of volume. Now, all people, even in the best case scenario, over time, people develop lat lateral lipoatrophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This means in front of the ears. Um, but I mean, with the older, with the, with the SMAS facelift, there's no question people need so much volume as the years go on. That's crazy. And to me, that's one of the greatest sell points. It's almost yeah. like you can't fill it. You probably have to use five, excuse me, or six vials of filler per side. Yeah. And the reason why is, is if you're lifting the skin and peeling it back, you're lifting it in the fat layer of the face, which causes yeah. fat destruction and lipoatrophy. And what you see in patients as they age, when they've had a smash facelift, is you see a line that goes through the side of the face because everything right. here lost fat volume, but everything above that didn't. So they wind up with this very characteristic line through the side of their face which yeah. people call a joker line. They call it, you know, you know, whiskers. Like they say, I don't want to have those whiskers that seem to radiate around the mouth. That's all from yeah. subcutaneous fat loss. And lipo, lipoatrophy can be absolutely treated with Sculptra, other fillers, you know, name yeah. it. You, yeah. you do it all day. I always have to use a cannula because there tends to be scar tissue there. You know, a lot of people have this misconception. They, they'll say, oh, I want the short scar, the mini, the this, the that. I said, listen, you do it or you do it. You can't be half pregnant. You know yeah, what yeah, yeah, exactly. But they, so that's what's so goofy about it. But here's the thing, which is important to understand, is that patients equate mini surgery with the length of the incision that's placed around the ear. So you can make a very small hidden incision like a, what I call it a ponytail kind of incision where the incisions go in the yes. ear canal and around the back, but not a typical very long incision. But people yeah. equate the incision length with the surgery. But through a small incision, it's like working under the hood of a car. You can use a small yeah. incision with minimal scarring, but do a lot of restructuring underneath. So it doesn't have to be this big, scarifying, horrible thing that people think it is. It can still be somewhat minimally invasive in that respect. But it's not really a mini facelift. It's a deep plane facelift. Did you talk about the, when you say your ponytail lift, that's what you're referring to in the ear? Yeah, well, it's a retrotragal incision. The incision's abbreviated. There isn't as much of a incision that goes up into the sideburn hair. So people don't lose sideburns because just like you've seen, I'm sure, a million patients with lipoatrophy, yeah. you see tons of people who have had the temporal hair tuft, you know, that's the sideburn hair, completely lopped off the side of their head by an extended incision facelift that obviously turns them into a hairline cripple, which is a difficult problem to deal with. Now, how is it with men, you know, cause men don't have, most men don't have very long hair, certainly not as chic as yours. And, uh, <laughs> you know, do they, how do they do with deep yeah, I do so many, because I, they're always concerned. Yeah, but the incision. They're always concerned about the hair. I mean, I, I, did a, I did a gentleman this week who's basically wears his hair like he's, you know, buzzed down to less than a one. I think you know who I'm talking about. And what yeah. we do with men is, is you know the incision really gets stopped at the top of the tragus and then on the back of the ear it really goes all the way up the back of the ear but not like this way which we wouldn't do in a woman anyway but we make the incision even shorter in men and i do a lot of bald men you know it's yeah. it's pretty routine because a lot of guys lose hair and instead of yeah. getting a hair transplant or wearing that kind of weird you know kind of u shape to their hairline they just shave their head so obviously yeah. there are tons of guys in finance they're you know bankers or CEOs or people who lead businesses and entrepreneurs who, when they get to be in their late 50s and early 60s, it, it, it makes you look like you're less vibrant, capable. You know, you, you don't want to be the yeah, face absolutely. of the face of your brand looking like your grandpa. Yeah. And, you know, it, you know, yeah, you could yeah. be you can run 100 miles. But when your face starts to really get that posture that makes you look sallow, sour and worn, it doesn't inspire confidence in your team. It doesn't inspire confidence in your consumer. So I literally, and I'm not exaggerating, 20 to 25 percent of my practice is male facelifts now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And I, you know, I tell people too, for a lot of the guys who are kind of like wary about it, I said, listen, if their shift of beard, I mean, I laser hair removal it. You know, it's it's not a big deal. Yeah, and that's the only real difference from my perspective with a man or a woman is beard shift. And then in those situations, yeah. we have ways of dealing with it. 
And even if they didn't do something, which they most of them do with laser hair removal or some other way, form of you know to, to remove the hair, at the end of the day, it's a manicuring problem. <laughs> it's not the end of the yeah, world. Yeah. You know, it requires it's a little bit of extra effort, and it's annoying. But you know, here's the thing about getting older: there's lots of things that are annoying. So if you could look 15 to 20 years younger and you have to trim a little bit more bearded hair in the inside of your canal behind your ear, if you can look 20 years younger, I think it's worth it. it. <laughs> so you and, I, you, you and I have been doing this for a few decades now, and I'm sure... Um, we're in our third decade, we, brother. This is the third know, decade that we're doing it. this. It's crazy, I right? I'm sure... I'm sure 99% of the patients, or at least overwhelming majority who come to you, have been to someone like me. They've gotten injectables, they've gotten fillers, they get neuromodulator. It adds a whole different perspective when, so, you know, in some ways it may be easier because the patient's more maintained. But in other ways, as you know, we get this concept that my audience knows about, filler burnout, where people are stretched, they're glossy. Um, what is your what is your approach when you see someone that comes in and they just had they've been fighting with so much non-invasive stuff is it a detriment to your work what, what do you do yeah it's not a detriment at all and i have i you know i would say that on average 80 percent of patients have been engaging those treatments 20 percent haven't so that's a less usual to have a patient who hasn't been engaging non-invasive treatments for at least a decade you know most people start doing things late 30s, early 40s, and most people start considering a facelift somewhere between their late 40s and mid 50s if they're very proactive, right? There are people who are proactive and there are people who are reactive. The reactive patients come when they're 60 years old and they're tripping over their jowls. The people who come in their late 40s and early 50s are people who are attractive, they're fit, and they've been doing everything to fight the good fight. And, you know, we applaud them because they, they make the world beautiful, right? <laughs> so... So most people have it, and it really doesn't create any problem for me. Um, the problem becomes when somebody has been overfilled, for sure, because it does create a certain amount of subcutaneous fat atrophy, because a lot of that pressure from all that extra filler that's been put in there, it starts to create dermal thinning, it winds up creating fat loss, and now you're removing all that stuff, and then when you remove it, you, you need to deal with the deficits that are left behind. So you're not just doing a facelift in that situation, now you're doing reconstructive procedures to shift muscle, add fat back, you have to start doing more fat grafting and other things to just create normal contour. So that doesn't happen. Which you know how to do. Yeah, that's what I do. But you know, before I just did ex a facial uh, aesthetic surgery exclusively, I did about 6,000 you know, facial cancer reconstructions. Yeah, so for yeah. me, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. For the average cosmetic surgeon who just has always been trained and done aesthetic surgery, I don't know that they have as many of those tools in their tool belt, so it becomes more of a problem. Now, okay. do, you know, but the average person who's been treated by somebody who has a metered hand like you, who knows how much to do, when not to do it, when to tell a patient to stop, and here's the problem. You know, yeah. even with the best of intentions, sometimes the doctor doesn't allow himself or herself to take charge and say no to a patient because we all want to please our patients they come to us they trust us and they're you know they're asking us for things but sometimes we have to be like a parent right like you tell your kids you know too much you know, good things are good things but too much of a good thing is not good for you so it's a reflection on the doctor yeah it is but then some doctors are too willing to please for whatever reasons and there's a whole myriad of reasons that it's not important but that's when patients wind up getting themselves into trouble. And then they do that for a few years and now they have all that tissue destruction and distortion. And then the other thing is that I deal with is when people have had too much energy put into their face. So all, all of these energy-based devices are fantastic. Things like old therapy, face tight, Thermi tight, needle RF, Morpheus. These are amazing tools. And lots of times they're useful after surgery. So here's the thing, yeah. like you said before, yeah. It's not like you're going to do a facelift and you don't need volume. That's crazy. You know, you're going to continue to age. You're going to continue to atrophy. There are going to be transitions and things that need to be dealt with with volume. You're obviously always going to need a neuromodulator for the rest of your life. That's never going away with surgery. Yeah. And after you have surgery done, using an appropriate dose and treatment regimen of energy can help maintain a facelift outcome. 
So yeah, I do that. Yeah, it, it's fantastic. See, but this is the thing for the people who really want to kill it, like crush it and maintain it. It's not all of one or all of the other. The people, who, it's just like it, it's like a, it's really like a fantastic soup, right? It's like any meal you've ever prepared. It's not like you know you put ton of one spice in and that's what makes it good. It's all of the details. Yeah, and but if but here's the problem I think in our field is that doctors are very territorial and they want to keep the patient to themselves. And you know, listen, maybe there's guys out there who are good enough to be able to become really good at surgery and all the other stuff. I don't think that's possible because yeah. once anybody starts to divide their attention, they start to become a jack of all trades, masters and master of none. I think that exists in surgery as well. Surgeons who are trying to do too many different types of procedures all throughout the body, they can only become so good at it because to become really an artist, and, and I say an artist because what we do, you and I, surgery and non-surgery, it's art because everybody has a scalpel, everybody has a technique. Even with the same technique, what people can create is completely different. It takes an amazing amount of focus, evaluation of our outcomes, and striving to become better and better every day and a passion for helping yeah. people and for what we create. And it's not right, easy well, to do that. If you listen, can't that, just do that. That's, what, that's why we work together. And I always say, you know, um, do you want to go to a doctor who does everything or just does a lot of a few things? And I think it's about staying in your lane. I mean, I know in California, there are an enormous amount of dermatologists who are trying to do these like mini lifts and this and that. And, you know, again, you know, you want to go to someone who is going to be really good at what they do, know their limitations, know when to refer out. Know when to refer them, out. Know when to refer out. out. My patients are always like, oh, you must hate sending for facelifts. I'm like, I love sending for facelifts. It makes my job easy. There's nothing more difficult than trying to satisfy someone who's getting fillers for the last 15, 20 years, and they keep not getting the same result that they expect that they had 15 years ago. I say, you have a couple of choices. We either keep doing what you're doing and be satisfied that we're getting older, you do less, which is usually not an option, or you decide to take the next step. I say, I promise I'll see you back at month three. We'll reintroduce some injectables. And for people out there, that's usually if someone has a good course post-op, when I could start reintroducing some filler around the mouth, some neuromodulators, even after brow lift, having your eyes done, using neuromodulators actually helps to healing because you're not putting the same amount of stress on the wound. Yeah, you're um, not I flexing the muscles and, and, and causing all those problems. Problems and for sure, and you know, three months is is definitely for me is is a time that I prescribe for patients is the best time. Two months is a little bit early because unless you're like somebody yeah. who's a really good healer, then it can cause exactly. you to swell more and all the issues. But three months is great. Yeah, and I usually tell patients, you know, I think the old you're not like this, but there, there's this old plastic surgery adage like give your scars one or two years to fully mature before you do anything. I mean, usually I see post-ops at about one month. If I see redness, if I see any spreading, if I see any whiteness, I hit, I always say you want to clean up your room before it gets too dirty. Oh you my want God. To hit yeah. it with multi-lasers. You want to consider uh, whatever options out there. I always find being proactive, like pro-aging, the earlier you address issues, the better people are, which is why I tell people just because uh, uh, Dr. Jacona is going to do your facelift i'm still there i'm gonna see you for the post op it's a it's a relationship and people like that we tag team the patients it, they feel like they have seen one and yeah, one game. well but this is the anytime i can get a, get somebody like you to consult with me if i'm you know want to help a patient heal quicker the two heads are better than one and it's like yeah. funny instead of being territorial the more information that we can get from each other and the the, the more perspectives on a problem yeah. How could it be helpful, you know? Yeah, but I know. what I want to say, one thing that you said before, uh, you know, just like just mention it is you need to know when to refer and what your limitations are. And again, it's this uh, same thing with not wanting somebody to 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 help with the post-operative course or to, you know, or to, to to intervene when it's helpful. You know, you really need to check your ego at the door. <laughs> the problem is, is that yeah. doctors, surgeons, people in the aesthetic industry. We, we tend to have big egos because we do wonderful things and people really adore us for what we do for them. But that's wonderful and it's wonderful to have great relationship with people and to be appreciated. But you really need to check your ego. 
because when yeah. you start getting to a point where you think you know everything and you think you can do everything you know and you and you don't understand your own limitations and you continue to enforce your will on people to their own de potential detriment is when we, you and I see the problems, right? You see the person who's had way too much surgery and they have all these, you know, contour problems and all these issues because yep. too much was done. You know, maybe the patient wasn't a candidate for a surgery. Maybe they've had too much surgery. Just like I see somebody who had somebody who's had too much energy, too much filler and too much of everything. And now they have a problem. So, yeah. you know, and that's why it's a very difficult thing for the average consumer to figure out you know who to go to it's really tough I know. yeah i know i always i tell my residents if you have a good patient and a good doctor for every no there are many other yeses particularly in my field in cosmetic dermatology i got 40 different lasers i said just because i won't put any more filler in your lip or your cheekbones doesn't mean i can't find something to make you less concerned about what's bothering you here's the thing this is why it's very difficult for plastic surgeons you know who want to do these things they don't have 40 different lasers because this is not what they do every day. So what they do is they have one laser or two and that no matter what problem you have, that laser becomes the, the, the treatment option. When I have a hammer, the whole world's a nail. And how could I possibly, you know, but how, but how could a, a person who doesn't invest and focus, again, this is about focus. It's about, you know, constantly trying to elevate the standard of care it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of folks. It takes a lot of money. You know, yeah. you, you need to be willing to continuously invest in your patients and in technology to be able to really give them cutting edge care. And I think when it comes to lasers, especially, you know, you need to be in the game. You need to be there. You need to be at the meetings. You need to know what what new treatments are coming out, what new energies are out there how they're being combined, you know, you can't just have, you sit on your laurels and have a, a laser box that's sitting in your office for the last seven years and think that that's, that's giving yeah. your patients the highest quality of care. It's just not possible. And, and you don't, you don't want to have your facelift done by somebody who does like three a month in between like breasts and yeah, lipo or, or whatever. whatever. Yeah, of course not. You want to go to somebody who does like several in a day. Yeah. You, you, you want to go to obviously with facelifting because it's such, it's, it's with, with arguably, and I think most people realize this, it's the most difficult operation to get right. And, you know, unless you're doing it all day, every day of your, of your practice, you know, and here's the other sad part. And I don't want to, you know, it's very easy for me to say this at this stage of my life, right? Because we're both approaching our third decade, decade of practice. But the truth is, is that when it comes to these things, it probably does take somewhere around 15 to 20 years to get really good at this stuff. <laughs> So when you're a younger surgeon, even though you may be smart and talented, there's a certain amount of, you have to be a journeyman. You have to have had thousands of procedures under your belt to have the judgment to be able to create fewer problems for people and to make good decisions intraoperatively, which is where things happen. So unfortunately, there's no way through it. All surgeons have to, and all surgeons, all dermatologists, all people do all different types of some more invasive, minimally invasive, non-invasive treatments. Yeah. They have to get that experience. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, when I get my facelift, I'm going to go to a guy who's got at least 20 years under his belt. You know, and you, everybody can't be that person. Yeah. But if you're yeah. not going to go to somebody who's got a lot more experience, you need to do a lot of homework. You need to see a lot of their work, whether it's surgical or non-surgical. Being able to see lots of examples of somebody's artistry, because what we do is not. It's not it's not technical work it's artistic work and that's you know, the difference I think part of that talent and sure. experience that comes with decades isn't about saying yes to everything it's also no knowing when to say no when i was a younger man i thought i can do everything and be predictive yeah yeah but that's because and here's an old saying that i that i use often because you know i teach a lot of fellows and residents you know i have my own fellow that trains with me for a year every year they don't do any surgery on my patients they just assist me and they do surgery on their own patients because we have yeah. a fellow clinic. So they get to watch me and then try out what I do with, with other people. But what I say to them is this, and it's true. Judgment comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. <laughs> so as young oh. doctors, yeah, as young doctors, what we always do is we try to please everybody or we take on problems that aren't fixable and then we learn the hard way. And what, what you're really getting with the, with the more senior doc 
because you're getting all those life experiences because when they say no to you or they tell you that a problem isn't well treated by one method or another or when a surgeon says you're not a surgical candidate these are the minimally invasive things that would serve you better or vice versa that comes from making mistakes and you know you you know if you're man enough to admit it you know at the end of the day everybody's done surgery on patients that they shouldn't have operated on everybody yep. has injected yep. patients they shouldn't have injected because they weren't a good candidate and it wasn't for it was not done maliciously it was done with an intention to help somebody but when you learn those lessons the hard way that's what helps you prevent patients from having problems and that goes that throughout is. the preoperative treatment or the pre-treatment during the treatment and after the treatment all those phases are things where you're bringing all that vast experience and knowledge to the patient. Yeah. I love that is like the new that's the jaconoism right there. I want you to tell me that expression one more time. I'm putting that all over the internet. <laughs> judgment comes from experience and experience comes from poor judgment. <laughs> I love I mean that's amazing. I should have thought of that myself. I didn't think of I it, but somebody told me about it so I had to steal. I'm going to I'm going to credit you with it. The, the last topic, actually, I want to talk about lift lifts. That's going to be our last topic. But a quick thing that I always ask plastic surgeons, because, you know, I'm a, I do an enormous amount of fillers. I use every filler out there. One of the very popular filler that dermatologists use in the face, Sculptra, I don't like using in the face. I use so much of it in the body. Um, and my concern in the face is it creates a fibrosis in the skin that may affect surgery. Oh, without question. I hate sculpture. Like, like the worst of it. Yeah. Like, I, like I, I absolutely hate sculpture. And it's so funny because about 10 years ago, I was in a plastic surgery meeting somewhere and lecturing. And, you know, well, you know, they have all the vendor booths. And, you know, I went up to the sculpture guys and I told them, I said, your product is death. <laughs> and I was like, this is the... Yeah, it's great scar tissue. Oh, that, because this, this is what they don't tell patients, and this is the truth. The collagen. Yeah, exactly. So when they say is, is when they inject sculpture that you're going to get collagen, what patients don't realize is scar tissue is collagen. So when they, it conjures up the idea of collagen being this soft, smooth, supple tissue that we had in youth, but what you get from sculpture is you get nodularity and fibrosis, which is basically like cement. So when I have patients yes. who have been sculpture patients for a decade i know that i'm going to basically be i'm going to be working through cemented tissues which distorts the anatomic planes and it's going to put the patient recovery to be three times longer than normal and it's going to make my job so much harder and their outcome no matter how good i am their outcome is going to be inferior to somebody who wasn't treated with sculpture as their primary primary volumizer as compared to somebody who had HAs done, period, done over, over it's with. another thing I'm going to tell everybody because all these derms, they disagree. I like every other filler. No, 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 this is not, this is not debatable, Paul. This is not debatable. I mean, if, if you came into the OR one day and saw me do one of these, you would literally put on a surgical glove, put your finger on the tissue and you would feel like you were rubbing your finger along the surface of concrete. The tissues don't feel soft. They don't feel normal. It is, and there, it, it's just like a ball of scar. And because when sculpture is injected, the, the methodology that we're all taught, because I was taught to use sculpture many years ago, and when I was taught by, by, a, by a, a master sculpture injector, when I first tried it, and I don't do injectables anymore, but this was a long time ago when I wasn't as busy doing surgery, and I did some injectable treatments, the needle goes into and out of the tissues in multiple planes. So it goes superficial, it goes deep, it goes through the muscle, it goes over the bone. So what happens is you get scar tissue from the bone to the skin. So it's not like this, the scar tissue is in one layer, it's everywhere. So anybody who says that's not true just has never had the opportunity to see what happens during a patient's surgery who has been treated with sculpture for a long time. Now one sculpture treatment doesn't do that. I will right. tell you that because I've had but patients who tell me, yeah, the, these are people who have been doing it annually because it's something that if you do sculpture and that's your primary treatment, you're going to go in every year for a touch-up. And there are most people, I would say, who do engage these treatments as part of a pro-aging approach, right? People who are maintaining their tissues, trying to keep things where they want them. 
they start usually on average, and I don't know what your experience is, but from what I'm seeing patients that are in late 40s and early 50s, they're 10 years deep for sure in doing injectable treatments. So if you're 10 years deep in Sculptra, you're going to have a problem without question. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. That's great. I can't wait to tell the world that I am right along with you. Um, I want to, the, the last topic, I want to speak about a, a procedure that I think you're one of the reasons why I get asked about this so much. You've just really made this procedure, that's, which I believe has been around a long time, quite popular, and that is the lip lift. Yeah, sure. Okay. Tell me, tell me who's a good and bad candidate and what this achieves. So, so the reason why, I mean, I do aging face surgery, so I do facelifts. That's my job. And part of aging is gravitational changes in the tissues, right? So what happens is, is that our face falls, our neck falls, you know, maybe the lateral brow falls, the brows become heavy. And, you know, Botox helps that for a while, obviously, and it needs to be done afterwards. But there's a point at which you can only get so much brow elevation with Botox. I mean, it helps, Absolutely. but you get gravitational change. But here's a newsflash. The gravity doesn't just affect you here, here, and there. It affects you here. So when eventually yeah, happens, right. and a lot of people do fillers in their lips, and they're delicious and beautiful. We all love seeing them. With the weight of filler in the lip, or even without filler in the lip, gravity affects us here. So our face becomes elongated, the jowls fall, the lip becomes longer and falls. A young woman's mouth and posture has a shorter distance from here to here. And if you ask patients, and I do, to bring me pictures of them from their 20s, 30s, 40s, and maybe now they're in their 50s, you will see a progressive lengthening of their upper lip. Now, we don't cerebrize this when we look at somebody. Yeah. We don't look at them and go, oh, their lip is long, they're older. But when we get the gestalt of the face, you can do an entire facelift, but if the lip is long and hanging, the patient still looks 50. But if you do this because it frames the center of the face and shorten that distance, it makes people look automatically youthful. Now, it doesn't mean everybody needs a lip lift because there are some people who that doesn't happen to. But it happens to enough people. And generally speaking, the number of millimeters of distance between the nose and the lip, once it gets above 16 millimeters, it starts to make people look long, quote unquote, long in the tooth, older, droopy, scowly, and usually the lip will start to cover the upper teeth. One of the fixes that people try to do is they put really long veneers in and they get these big teeth because they're trying to project their teeth below their lip when really their lip just needs to be shortened back to the way it was in youth. Or they overfill their lip and they put Botox around there, which makes it worse. It drops it. And over 10 years, it's going to drop the lip. So that's yeah. why I do a lot of lip lifts is because it's part, uh, it can be, not for everybody, and not everybody goes for it. It's not like I push it, but I will introduce that idea and concept. And when people see it, they, they realize that if they're trying to restore, which is what aging face patients want to do, most of these people are very happy with their appearance in youth. They just want to restore. They don't want to change who they are. And that's the biggest fear about all facial surgery. People don't want to look unrecognizable to themselves. They just want to look recognizable to themselves, which means they want to look like they used to look. Because that's having right. bad surgery makes you unrecognizable to yourself. Absolutely. But when you look in the mirror and you become unrecognizable to yourself because of aging changes, you want to restore. And part of restoring is restoring the distance. Now, that's a different thing. I see then when people go to California and they get lip lifts and they're 27 years old and they want a lip that looks like this, that's yes. a lip lift too. But that's what scares the living crap out of everybody about a lip lift is because there's a bunch of like Instagram influencers and people who have extremely exaggerative, you know, bucky lips with no distance between their nose and the lip that makes them look like a caricature and looks ridiculous. Yes. So yeah. this is something that I think is more appropriate in the aging patient. And if you're going to do it, you need to know how to do it so the scar is less perceptible and you can be done so it looks like a fine hairline. But also, you need to know, just like with fillers and with surgery, you need to know how much to do and what not to do. And that's where the judgment comes in. Yeah. Surgeons overdo lip lifts and it makes bad scarring and it makes people look ridiculous. That's the problem. What one of the common things that people come into me, uh, they've had lip lifts from all over the country or the world. They sometimes complain that the center of their upper lip is lifted and the rest of the mouth is Yes. Sad. And what I tell them is, 
I tell them we're going to do some perioral volumization to lift the corners. I put into the lateral filtrum, I put into the nasolabial fold, whether they've had a facelift or not. And what it does is it recreates the balance. You could use Botox in the depressor angular oris to help lift the corners of the mouth. And it, it does what the rest of the lip lift should do to create balance in the face. Yeah. And sometimes people are just pulled too high. Yeah, but they get pulled too high centrally. And here's the problem. Most surgeons will limit their lip lift from here to here. Yeah. When you properly design a lip lift, you need to lift. And this is why I wrote my textbook. You know, my textbook yeah. goes over all this because I want everybody to know how to do these things properly. Is that you need to lift the lateral segments of the lip. The problem is, is that people get peaked in the center and then the doctor doesn't yes. do anything to lift the sides. So then that also looks distorted because if your lip is long, it doesn't look great. But if your lip is short here and long on the sides, it looks ridiculous. If someone has a very thin nose, does it limit, like, does it make someone a poorer candidate? I mean, it would depend. If somebody had like a super narrow nose, like maybe they've had an overly aggressive rhinoplasty, you would need to tone down how much you could lift the lip. So it's not that you couldn't have a lip lift, but if you wanted a lip lift of a certain distance, this is where judgment comes in. You would have to accept less of a lip lift in order to create not, not create other distortive problems with the nose and with the lip. So this is why lip lifts can be so dangerous because when too much is done, it's not reversible. When you yes. remove the tissue, you can't put it back. The number of patients that I've seen because I've done over 2,000 lip lifts who come to me who've had lip lifts all over the country and now they're looking for it to be reversed and I can't help them. I can yeah. help balance yeah. things. So if somebody has the central lip segment lifted more than the sides, I can go back and lift the sides and get it to be balanced. Or they can go to you and get balancing by doing, you know, using neuromodulators and fillers to, to turn the corners of the mouth up. There are fixes for that. But unfortunately, when somebody has been over resected in a lip lift, there's no way to fix it. You can't put skin back. There's no skin graft you can put in there that would look normal. There's no tissue expansion. There's nothing. So this is why lip lifts can be yeah. one of the most wonderful, but also one of the most dangerous procedures out there. Yeah. How do you tell, how long do you tell your patients? Because I know they ask me this all the time. Um, how long do you tell your patients their results are going to last before they need to come in for another deep plane? I assume deep planes last longer than uh, all the other ones. What, what, what is your guesstimate for most of your patients? Yeah, so when I used to do smash facelifts, I would definitely say that people were starting to see a lot of signs of aging around five, five, or five to seven years. So they would last lo shorter. But that was with when something called an extended SMAS facelift where you lift the whole SMAS. Most people do a SMAS plication where you just put some stitches in the SMAS. That lasts two or three years. Done. So people, the number of people I do a deep plane on who had a SMAS plication lift two years before, it's one out of every three facelifts that I do. So, But a deep plane facelift usually lasts patients on average at, I, I'd say, a minimum of 10 years. But I've had many, many patients where I've seen them 12 to 15 years later and they're pretty satisfied with the outcome. It's definitely more durable and I know that because I used to do those other kinds of facelifts. So the reason why I do deep plane is not just because it looks more natural and it makes people look a lot younger, it's because as a surgeon I want to deliver a product that's going to give patients value. Nobody's happy when they have a facelift and two years later they feel like they need another facelift. That, yeah. that's not that's that's not what it, you, you know nobody's happy the patient's not happy you're not happy you're doing a secondary procedure to tuck them up and do something else two years later it's just not ideal so that's yeah. what i tell my patients well part of making happy patients i honestly believe this uh, Andrew, for you and me, is also keeping the doctors very happy. Clearly, both you and I are extremely passionate about what we do. We honestly get pleasure by working. Um, but I also know that you take your family life, your social life, your athletic life very seriously. So one of the things I ask all my guests on the Pro Aging Podcast is what is it outside of the office that really keeps you driven to feed your professional life and your home life and keep you that happy person that I think you reflect to your audience. Yeah. So I think that the, the, the most important thing to do is to have time and space away from what you do to be able to reflect and to recharge. And people do that many different ways. Yeah. But I think that unfortunately professional people, whether they're physicians, attorneys and accountants, you know, engineers, we tend to be people who work at very, very diligently what we do, become very good at what we do, 
but we do it to our own detriment and it burns us out and it makes us less creative. Um, so for me, you know, I'm, I take more and more time away from work. I probably don't work about four months a year of working days, like Monday through Friday days that I take off and they're strategically planned to spend time with my family because at the end of the day, you know, I think that anybody once who's looking back on their life, of course, we're passionate about what we do and we're excited about what we do. But one of the things that makes me most happy in my life is my relationship with my children and my family. So it's, you know, that's the number one priority and that recharges me. But family and fitness, food and wine. <laughs> that's right. And you got to work out because he does like good wine, people. A lot of calories right? and wine. But this guy, he gave me some of the most amazing, he turned me on to opus one which is one of the most amazing california cabs so at his good. house one time it's amazing no. but but you're, you know you're, cooking you're, you're good, good food person. you know art you know the thing for me is is that family first then fitness because i really believe that in order to be able to perform at a high level you need to have a high level of fitness you just need to yeah. you know you, your agree. physicality shouldn't be restricting you in any way and you know and it the, the, work it, it well if you're exhausted how could you be creative if you're, you know, if you're, if you're sore or tired, how could you really have to go the distance? You know, the thing is that you have to be as good for your last patient as you do for your first patient. You know, that's right. All right, boss. You know what? We both have some Japanese food to eat. Okay, so I'm gonna let you go, but I want you to tell everyone in the audience how they could find you. Yeah. So easy way to find me. You can find me on Instagram and at Dr. Jacono. I'm also at Dr. Jacono on Twitter and and Facebook, and I guess you can find me at NewYorkFacialPlasticSurgery.com if anybody actually uses websites anymore. You know what? After this great podcast, I think I've deserved it. You look much better with a mustache and a beard. I think you're going to be Oats and I'm going to be Hall. Okay? Dude, we got it, bro. That's All right. Both equally talented. Two great tastes that taste great together. Thank you, Dr. Giacono. You're the man. I will speak to you shortly. And I think that's a wrap, people. We'll see you next time. Peace.